Welcome back to the New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. We are one day away from the 14th anniversary of 9-11, and I really think we're seeing the fascist fruits of that day. It's the catalyst for James and I doing what we're doing, our work to this day. But the news about the 14th anniversary of September 11th is that there isn't really any news about the 14th anniversary of 9-11. James, you and I even communicated early, early this morning and said, there's really not anything we would make an entire, that we would build an entire New World Next Week episode around the anniversary. I had to go digging for any sort of new news around the anniversary. And we'll include the scant bit of, of coverage that I found. And the most interesting one, James, at the top, it's quite literally screaming from the top of the search results. Colleges brainwash students into believing 9-11 was our fault. It's a New York Post screed written by a guy named Paul Speary, a Hoover Institution fellow and author of Infiltration, How Muslim Spies and Subversives Have Penetrated Washington. And he basically whines and cries about how our colleges are crazy liberal bastions and they're giving sympathy to the terrorists and they don't teach anything about the victims. And, and it's a phony left-right argument that isn't really worth a whole lot. Some of the other articles, James, surrounding the 14th anniversary, children of 9-11 want to focus on the future. And it's a pretty heartbreaking uh, news video about the kids of, of those lost on 9-11, mostly just wanting to kind of move ahead and, and get on with their lives. I can't even really imagine what that must feel like. On the positive notes, however, there's a bunch of fundraising and outreach that's been going on and really building over the last several months and years from architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. They are working on fundraising, and I think they're halfway there for a billboard in downtown New York City, which needless to say would be seen by millions and millions and millions of people. And also, speaking of being seen by millions of people, former Daily Show host Jon Stewart, the best work he has really ever done, hands down, is his work for 9-11 first responders. He's actually going to head to Capitol Hill very soon to lobby to keep the 9-11 health programs going, the James Zadroga 9-11 Health Act. A lot of that stuff is really going to start to to evaporate really soon. So trying to make those things permanent, as we've just noted here even recently on these episodes, People dying at an alarming rate due to 9-11 related illnesses. But James, I think as the anniversary hits, the biggest thing for me that kind of boggles my mind, and I guess it shouldn't, is how everybody can kind of salivate and emote over all the latest Terra Noia news and not connect it to 9-11. It seems like today's chaos, screaming from the headlines, has been completely divorced from the catastrophic and catalyzing event that precipitated it all. James? Uh, exactly right. And salivate in a moat is the right way of putting that because it brings to mind uh, Pavlov's dog. I mean, you ring the bell and he salivates, but uh, eventually you can just ring the bell. There doesn't have to be any food. He'll salivate just by the sound of the bell. So people can be trained 9-11 terror, 9-11 terror, 9-11 terror. And eventually it's just terror. And we just feel that terror in our bones because we've been told to do so. And we all remember that snuff film that played out on live TV 14 years ago. So it is a Pavlovian response that's been conditioned into the public and now they can take away the actual thing that caused it in the first place and still get the same response. That's disturbing in many ways, but perhaps even more disturbing is the fact that if 9-11 really isn't the cultural touchstone that it was and isn't the uh, the thing in the psyche that drives forward this war on terror narrative that has been the convenient excuse for waging wars of aggression around the world for the last decade and a half, well, that might mean that they need a new catalyzing event to continue that transformation that the project from the New American Century warned about 15 years ago. So... There could be a downside to that uh, lack of uh, response for 9-11. But anyway, I think with regards to that New York Post screed about college brainwashing, I think one of the most offensive things in there was uh, the, the, the suggestion that anyone who doesn't 100% follow the official mainstream narrative of 9-11 and what we're supposed to believe about it doesn't care about the people who died, doesn't care about first responders or things of that sort, which is a demonstrable lie because for years and years, the only ones bringing attention to the issue of the first responders were 9-11 truth groups who actually were working with these people and caring about what happened 
happened to them, whereas they were completely left by the, main, uh, the, the, the wayside after they'd been used as political stage puppets for uh, politicians to, to parade around with. Uh, they were left by the wayside to die because, of course, EPA, the air is safe to breathe. They can't be wrong. That's a conspiracy theory. So, uh, I, I mean, just the association in the minds of the public with 9-11 truthers and people who don't care about the people who died is just ridiculous. On its face, a demonstrable lie and one that we have to spit back in their face with uh, with fury. Well, and I think uh, reaching the point where we're the only ones that still ever kind of talk about it, I think it shows that kind of proof in the pudding, so to speak. But it's also, I think New York Post is, is Murdoch, so it kind of fits that that's sort of the Murdoch, Fox News, why do you hate America kind of kind of garbage. So, James, I, I, I suppose we'll kind of have to leave our, our 14th anniversary coverage of 9-11 there for this New World next week. But I think our, our second story, I think, flows quite well from that. And in some ways, it's, it's positive. And it's just as you noted, if the effects are wearing off, then that's what we have to brace ourselves for. Because the, the terror addicts, the ones who get their power from scaring the populace, they might, they might need another fix very soon. As we've been talking about on these, on these episodes for the last few weeks, is there is a lot of fear being ratcheted up about, oh, September. It's all going to go down this September. But let's go to a site called Pacific Standard. And there's an interesting article that, again, was submitted to us on Twitter using hashtag New World Next Week. It came from user at such underscore BS. Has conspiracy theory lost its negative connotations? And it begins by noting one way politicians deflect charges of wrongdoing is by uttering the words conspiracy theory. The term suggests a certain level of looniness, conjuring images of paranoid people struggling to find sinister patterns in random events. Or does it? University of Winchester psychologist Michael Wood decided to test whether the widely disparaged two-word phrase is really as pejorative as most of us assume. To his surprise, he found it is not. In two experiments, Wood found labeling an assertion a conspiracy theory had no significant effect on whether people believed it to be true. This held for generic statements about cover-ups and abuses of power, actual historical events, and one fictional incident set in a foreign country, Canada, actually. Quote, it is possible that the conspiracy theory label has simply lost some of the power it once had, Wood writes in the journal Political Psychology. Even when someone's very first exposure to an allegation of political corruption is seeing it branded as a conspiracy theory, they are no less likely to take it seriously than if it is instead called a corruption allegation. So that they essentially in the work swapped out those terms and put newspaper headlines and said, conspiracy theories, dog, you know, election results, and then said, corruption allegations, dog, really interchangeable in, in kind of a funny way. So the article does get into some of the details of the experiments, but doesn't mention the parts about MK Ultra, COINTELPRO, or Operation Mockingbird that are specifically used in the research as the, of course, real, factual, historical events that they are. So the article continues and, and towards the end. So how did the term lose its negative sting? Wood speculates this may reflect the romanticized image of conspiracy theories in popular media, such as films in which the lone hero takes on a sinister cabal, or perhaps the meaning of the term has been diluted to include mundane speculation regarding corruption and political intrigue. In any case, his findings suggest that if you want to discredit an allegation, simply calling it a conspiracy theory won't do the trick. Now, James, the funny postscript to this is at the very bottom of the article. Scroll all the way down, and you can see the article author Tom Jacobs. You see their other, you know, related stories. His other related stories are conspiracy theories harming climate change progress, or why do people believe conspiracy theories? So it's funny that even though he now knows it doesn't work from his own journalism, it doesn't stop him from throwing around in his headlines and articles, which I kind of got a kick out of. James will include the link to the full research and the appendices, and you can see all the stuff where they used Operation Mockingbird and, and others. And it's got a clever title. It's called Some Dare Call It Conspiracy. Labeling something a conspiracy theory does not reduce belief in it. Very interesting. And yes, it is kind of, I think it must be heartbreaking for the author of this article that conspiracy theory doesn't have the sting to it that he thinks it does. So maybe he'll have to start coming up with some new headlines to try to mock the uh, positions he doesn't like. But uh, if you look at the re further research of this Dr. Michael Wood, you'll find that his other research is very much along these lines, including uh, papers like What About Building 7? A Social Psychological Analysis of Online Discussion of 9-11 Conspiracy Theories, and 
Dead and Alive, Beliefs in Contradictory Conspiracy Theories, which, without even having read it, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to guess that that has to do with those crazy conspiracy theorists who think that Osama bin Laden died years ago, and that he wasn't killed in the raid, so he must be alive. Oh, these crazy conspiracy theorists, which, again, I think is just... Um, straw man, because obviously I don't know anyone who's arguing that, but uh, that's the type of garbage that these people think that people believe in. But anyway, it's extremely interesting to take a look at this phenomenon, because as I'm sure most people out there should know by now, certainly if they listen to episode 50 of the Corbett Report podcast, the term conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist was not exactly coined by the CIA, but it was certainly propagated by them back in the 1960s in CIA document 1035-960, uh, talking about criticism of the Warren Report, because, oh, these crazy conspiracy theorists are throwing around crazy conspiracy theories that the Warren uh, Commission didn't adequately investigate the assassination of JFK. Oh, heavens to Murgatroyd, do you think Alan Dulles didn't do a perfect job of uh, researching every angle? Um, obviously, uh, the CIA was worried about such criticism, so they sent that 1035-960 uh, around to their Mockingbird media assets. Yes, Operation Mockingbird, an admitted media pro uh, uh, conspiracy of media moguls and, uh, and journalists who were in the employ of the CIA, spreading the CIA's word for them. So they sent this around for them to uh, counter conspiracy theories with uh, CIA talking points. And lo and behold, when you do the, uh, the, the LexisNexis type shirt, searches on the phrase conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorist, suddenly they rocket after that CIA document gets passed around to the Mockingbird assets. So, yes, that's where the phrase comes from. That's how it was used as a pejorative. It's worked for decades and decades and decades, but lo and behold, suddenly you get the internet, you get blogging, you get online, people coming along with their own voices, and this media control over people's minds is suddenly broken, and uh, people are snapping out of these decades of conditioning and realizing Oh, conspiracy theory is just something they call any politically inconvenient truth. So, uh, so it isn't working in the same way as before. And again, unfortunately, to my mind, that brings to mind the possibility. Well, what are they going to come up with next? What is going to be the next weaponized phrase or even weaponized narrative to try to dismiss people with alternative uh, political constructs? And unfortunately, another technique they love to use is to set people up for things. So I'm sure we're going to see more of these conspiracy theorists are crazy terrorists' uh, ideas being planted in the media soon. But until then, let's just press forward and continue, uh, continue destroying, breaking their tool of psychological oppression right in their face, snapping it into and laughing at them. Well, and it's funny because sometimes sometimes we have to break it, but in other times they end up breaking it themselves because they they beat it too many times, just like the term conspiracy theory. And James, it's interesting. This is a sidebar. We'd have to do a whole other episode on this. As we've reached a point of the cognitive infiltration, and we've now gotten to a point that 14 years after 9-11, and we've mentioned this before, moments where perhaps, you know, conspiracy elements or truth or memes and things made their way into mass media, we'd get really excited in the alternative media. Oh, man, can you believe they snuck that in there? Now it's just a part of the big old huge mess at which point none of it really makes any sense and it doesn't really matter if you investigate the Illuminati and you can just hear Kanye say, oh, that's just a bunch of conspiracy theory stuff. So that's, that's an interesting one to know or to wonder about where we've gotten now thanks to paid trolls on the Fed's payroll mucking everything up like Cass Sunstein wants with the cognitive infiltration. We'll leave that as a sidebar for now and get back to the part about breaking the decades long programming. And James, I think any other week conspiracy theory losing its power, that would have been our good news next week stories. We continue to highlight all the positive stories we can on every episode of new world next week, all through 2015. But if I may be so self promotional, there's something I've really only talked about when asked, but the good news is I quit my corporate radio job and I'm going to make Media Monarchy my main thing. This 9-11 is the 10th anniversary of Media Monarchy, having launched with a simple post about HARP back on September 11th, 2005. So for the 10th anniversary, I'm going legit. I'm busy setting up server space, getting new audio and video equipment, and moving all the various blogs from the music show to the food show, cyber, all those things into one new and mighty MediaMonarchy.com. The site has been up and down a little bit as I'm kind of bumbling around behind the scenes, 
but I'm super excited for the future. More videos, more interviews, more music, and just flat out more media in the monarchy. And I hope I can get the support to do it as really, James, I just kind of, I realize and some of its nature, some of its nurture, but I'm just not happy working for other people. Yeah. I need to do this kind of work for myself. And it may turn out that I have to do freelance and other kind of AV gigs to keep everything going, but I just couldn't go into a corporate run radio station every day and smile through things I knew were lies. And the dirty secret is, is the inside corporate places they're totally scared because the internet's destroyed them. They have no ideas and they get all of their ideas from us. And that's how it's going to roll. And that's James, I think in some ways that we're going to keep winning. So we'll include a link to, I, I set up a Bitcoin address and I'm busily kind of setting things up. So if the website looks a little flunky, all my media and all the episodes and everything will still be online and still be accessible through the feeds as I'm working behind the scenes to set up a new mighty media monarchy.com. Excellent. Well, we definitely need uh, as much counter to the mainstream narratives as we can get. So it's great to see you coming back in full full steam ahead with uh, Media Monarchy. Um, you're, you have been around for the last several years, but not as much as you were before. And I'd love to see uh, what you're going to come up with. So I'm I'm 100% behind this. I'm very much excited to see what uh, what's coming and good for you getting off that corporate treadmill. Now, uh, at the risk of being a little bit self-promotional myself, I should mention that I have a very, very, I hope, a very important 9-11 uh, podcast documentary that's going to be dropping on the anniversary, so uh, people should prepare for that. And when it drops, if you enjoy it, please do spread it to the four winds. I've put a lot of work into it, and uh, I hope you appreciate it. Also, on Saturday, I will be presenting to the Rethink September 11th global webcast. Uh, it's for free viewing on the Rethink September 11th website. Uh, that runs all of Friday and Saturday. I'll be presenting on Saturday. I think it's around noon Eastern? No. 11 a.m. Eastern time, which is an ungodly hour of the night for me. So I'll drink a lot of coffee and see if I can uh, make it through. But uh, you're invited to join that. I'll I'll put the link down in the show notes for this video. And uh, we'll just have to keep pressing ahead for as many years as it takes to break the uh, the narrative of 9-11 and to, uh, to really expose it for what it is in the minds of the general public. James, I've got a lot of other New World Next Week headlines. Perhaps we'll, we'll, we've will we already put so much kind of on the record on this episode. We'll include them in the show notes. A lot of them are related to what we talked about last week, and that is now the refugee crisis that has exploded onto the front pages and all the sort of the emotional manipulation that goes on around that. And a lot of a lot of our, our great Twitter followers have, have submitted stories kind of breaking the, the main story down. So the interesting thing, James, as things really heat up, and we said it here a few weeks ago on the show, and now a Washington Post Amazon op-ed says the same thing. Congress should authorize war against ISIS. So now we are getting the call. We want war. We need war. And Cameron in the UK is turning into quite the Caesar. He's maybe even hoping for bombs for peace by October. And James, that's the really sketchy situation that we're in. But we're always in kind of sketchy situations. And I think it's it's doing the homework that helps learn our way forward. And as we noted last week, it's still true this week. And it'll always be true. It's a war on the psyche, James. That's it. Well, let's continue learning our way forward and stopping the bombs for peace, which uh, they so desperately want to start dropping on uh, brown people halfway around the world again. Let's continue doing this. Uh, looking forward to doing it again next week. Thanks, buddy. Take care.